You're listening to In the Green Chair, a podcast series by Relay Education, a Canadian charity that delivers hands-on quality programming about environmental topics, renewable energy, climate change, and green careers. I'm your host, Madison Kendall, and our guest today has many titles associated with her career, from marine biologist to phycologist to museum research scientist, and many, many more. Without any further ado, let's dive in with Dr. Amanda Savoie. Hello, Amanda. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for inviting me. So we're going to jump in. A common reaction to seaweed is shrieking, pretty much, um, when it touches you in the water. That's at least my reaction to it. Um, But you are a self-proclaimed seaweed lover. So if you were to write a love letter to seaweed, what would it say? Ooh, a love letter to seaweed. That's amazing. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that before, actually. I think what I would say and what I would want to share with people that think seaweed is scary is it's actually so beautiful. And especially for me, I love the rocky intertidal. So um, I'm from the East Coast of Canada, you know, from New Brunswick, and we have this beautiful Bay of Bunny where there are these sort of rocky, majestic coasts that like come down into the water we have the highest tides in the world and when those tides go up and down they expose this huge expanse of rock where there's so much biodiversity and so much biomass of seaweed and when you see it growing like that you definitely won't think it's gross and you feel like often low tide will be early in the morning and so you're up there the sun is rising you know the ocean mist and you see all this beautiful tide pools it's it's just super magical Perfect. Sign sealed delivered to seaweed. (laughs) So uh, your current titles are research scientist, botany, and director of the Center for Arctic Knowledge and Exploration, which are very cool titles. All labels considered and keeping our younger listeners in mind, how do you describe your job? Oh, that's such a good question. My job really varies from day to day. I do a lot of different things and, and Sort of even throughout the year, there's like a seasonality, of course, because I do field work and then I have, you know, computer work. But I basically I have an independent research program. So what that means is I, you know, I started working at the museum and it was up to me what I wanted to work on, which is just so wonderful. It's so That's amazing. amazing. I'm so lucky to work wow. here. And I, you know, I was super interested in seaweed biodiversity in Canada and um, biogeography, you know, where things grow, where they're found. So I started kind of trying to develop that research program, um, studying, you know, my my home base was in the Atlantic. And then I started working in the Arctic, too, because we just don't know. There's so much we don't know about seaweed in the Arctic. So day to day, I'm, you know, I'm planning field work. I'm looking at data. I also do um, molecular work. So I do some work in the lab sometimes. And I like to work at the microscope, looking at my seaweed specimens. And then I also, of course, have, you know, just all the same things that that anybody has just answering emails, going to meetings and that kind of stuff, which isn't as fun, but that's okay. I'm curious to know about the museum, because from from the reading that I did, it's not open to the public except the library. So what's what's the deal with that? So so basically um, how it works is we're... Well, how, how do I even start? There's so much to say. But so basically, we're the Canadian Museum of Nature. We have a museum downtown Ottawa. So the main sort of venue for the exhibits and the programs is this beautiful old historic building. It looks like a castle. When that building was originally built, let me think, I don't know the year, but it's very old. All the research, everything was happening all in this building. And in fact, it was actually sort of... Um, uh, social science and natural science and then at some point the museums were split and now it's just natural science so the museum of nature well of course the building was quickly like bursting at the seams with collections and, and so we have this research facility in Gatineau across the river we have millions of specimens there and they're all organized in these special rooms to protect them you know with the correct humidity the correct temperature and so that building technically isn't open to the public but it is open once a year for what we ha- we call our open house in October. And so we usually get like 3,000 visitors, something like that. that. And we set up stations. And so you can tour through the different collections, see all the things that aren't on display, and then talk to the researchers about it. Because all these collections are used for research. Yeah. That's so cool. So that's really cool. It's it's really, it's just super fun, like high energy day. It's where I'm exhausted by the end of the day because, you know, talk to thousands of people. But you just reach people so much and and to see like a lot of people don't know that museums 
are research institutions, right? Most natural history museums have a collection and have researchers, but we're kind of behind the scenes, right? The main venue is the museum downtown with the dinosaurs and the cool touch tank and, and different things like that. And then behind the scenes, we're working on all these collections, which some of them are hundreds of years old. And, and technically they belong to Canadians, right? We're a federal crown corporation and our role is to sort of steward these collections forever for, for research. Wow. And you have something like 20,000 species or specimen of, um, of seaweed? You know what? I don't know exactly, but something like 20,000, 30,000 for seaweed probably at the museum. Yeah. Like wow. a lot. But, I mean, vascular plants, they have like hundreds of thousands. What's so a vascular I'm plant? On- like a regular, a regular plant. Like or a regular a, plant, like, not an underwater you know, plant. I don't know, like my botany colleagues are probably going to laugh at that, but you know, like a regular plant. <laughs> it's, it's fine. You're helping, you're helping me. Yeah. So I'm working on getting the seaweed collections up even more because it's just such a, like we like to talk about collections, like every collection is a point in time and space where that species occurred where like maybe it doesn't occur anymore, right? So you can stay a hundred years ago, this specimen was found here and you know, it usually has a location, a collector, and a date. And then you can do research, all kinds of different research from that. So really there's fun. a there's a collector's name. Have you collected lots yeah. of species? Ooh, yeah, I've been goodness. doing... So when we do field work, I use field work to mean like work away from the museum. So going out like on an expedition or on a trip to collect specimens from somewhere. Obviously, Ottawa, I'm based in Ottawa. It's not by the ocean. So I always have to travel to go collecting. And you, you basically go down at low tide. So you walk over the rocks and everything's covered in seaweed. So we stuff our stash of rags full of seaweed samples. And then um, I should have brought some props, but we bring them back to the lab and then we press them on paper. Wow. So like pressing flowers in the same way. Exactly. But you also dive, right? Yes. Yes. Can you yes. can you tell me how you combine diving with a job? Around, I started scuba diving around the same time I started graduate school, but at the time I just wanted to dive. Like I didn't ever necessarily think I'd be doing it for work, but I just knew I wanted to scuba dive because I was in love with the ocean and I wanted to see what was down there. Um, And then during my PhD, yeah, I had the opportunity to go on some really cool scuba trips and do some training to become a scientific diver. Um, And then when I started working at the museum, there's like a little bit of a dive program, but only a few researchers were diving. And so now, now there's more of us and we're getting a bit more momentum. And and then we packed up all our gear and we went to the Arctic and that was wild. And my first dive in the Arctic was so cool because I was just so happy to be at the ocean, first of all. And the water, I say cool, it's like a pun because it was very cold. (laughs) Scientific diving is, it's a challenge. Like it's not... You, you take all the kind of gear and all the, you know, things you have to do when you're scuba diving, but then also collecting specimens, recording data at the same time. I mean, I love the challenge, but at first it can be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by a lot? There's definitely an extra challenge when you're like in zero degree water, wearing a bulky dry suit with seven millimeter neoprene gloves. Like <sighs> you're physically very uncomfortable, even though you're loving it, you know, because it's exciting and you're trying to collect like uh, you see all these tiny filamentous seaweeds and you're trying to pick them and put them in bags and keep them separate and right, right on a slate, like where you collected them. So you kind of just underwater. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so you're what? collecting them underwater and then you have like these, they call it like a slate. So it's like a piece of plastic you write on with a pencil. So you can say like bag number one, whatever. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. So I just, when I say it's a lot, I mean, it's just like physically a lot of That's tasks. a lot. That is a lot of tasks. And, yeah. and you're kind of, shivering a little and you know like yeah so wow wow okay I, 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 love, it. I love it so <laughs> I I can feel the love that you have for it I think that's so yeah. amazing wow so one of your specialties is Canadian seaweed diversity as we've heard um, and you've been researching that since your PhD I would love to know what you've discovered in your research about seaweed using DNA barcoding which um, was sort of you know, the there's like well uh, in Guelph, there's this center for DNA, Canadian Center for DNA Barcoding, where they really spearheaded this objective to you know barcode all life on Earth, and it's 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 coming along as far as I can tell. You know, it's still very active, and um, so we were my PhD supervisor at the time at the University of New Brunswick had really kind of discovered this worked very well for red algae, which are just a small subset of seaweeds, and 
What we found is that there was just a lot of species that hadn't really been described. It sounds so um, kind of like, okay, what, what does it matter if it's called something different? But it, it's really important for studying these groups to know like what they're called, what they're related to, how many there actually are, because then an ecologist or someone else can come along and you know identify, have the tools to identify them to say where they are. And when we don't really know what we're looking at, it can't be really quantified or, you know, we can't say, oh, it's rare or it's not rare if we don't even know what it looks like, right? So in most red algae and in seaweeds, there's just a lot of biodiversity that hasn't been properly studied. Why is that a problem? We can't study what we don't know we have. You know, taxonomy, uh, I thought I saw a quote somewhere that's like, taxonomy is the underpinning of all biological science. So having a proper name for every species is kind of part of the baseline of biology and then from there you can you can identify them you can study the distribution and with climate change of course distributions are changing um, we're getting invasive species we're losing habitat due to you know co coastal like pollution and construction and that kind of thing and so in order to say like protect an area like let's say we had a biodiversity hotspot um, that we wanted to protect you have to tell regulators like there's this many species living there and this is why they're special and if you can't you know, if you can't identify them or you don't know what's there, like nobody's going to care, I guess. Do you find it difficult to convey this information and the importance of this? I remember there was a prof that used to ask presentations at UNB sometimes, like, why should uh, tell, you know, my family member why their tax money should pay for this? And it's actually, it's a bit of an annoying question, but it's a good question because like, why should it? And then you develop, you think it through and you're like, you know, why is this important and how can I explain to people like that idea of an elevator pitch how can I explain to people why biodiversity research matters so much and I think and sometimes it can be kind of sad because sometimes I think are we just cataloging this biodiversity that's like being lost and that is kind of depressing but I still think it's important to do that too even if climate change and biodiversity loss there's like these huge it's a huge crisis, but I think like someone has to catalog what we have. And well, that data is really important it. so that you can bring it yeah. to people, even if they yeah. don't listen. You can say like data doesn't lie. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah, so anyway, it's that's part of the reason. And then there's all I mean, there seaweed are important food for fish and invertebrates, and we don't know yet. Okay, maybe maybe you think these two species look the same to you or I, they look the same, but to fish, like this one is good to eat and this one isn't, right? So there's all that kind of stuff like that that we think just because like humans can't tell them apart it doesn't matter but like the animals maybe can tell them apart that's so so true and so important and i i i like to garden um but i'm learning about pollinators and how biodiversity is incredibly important and planting native uh, species are is really important because it feeds into the the ecosystem of that specific area so in i guess underwater is that similar I think so yeah like so I, like I totally know what you, you mean also I love gardening and I like plant, planting native plants as well too nice. but um the idea that like an ecosystem is really everything has evolved together to kind of work together um in in a way that sort of you know fish might be dependent on a certain seaweed at a certain time of year in a similar way or invertebrates and what can happen is if that's disrupted, like one thing that can be really disruptive in the marine environment is marine invasive species. So on the east coast of Canada, the United States, there's some invasive species that sometimes like almost take over the whole subtitle and that's all that's growing. And the other thing is even um, not just as food, but as structures. So kelp forests, for example, are really important. Like they provide this habitat for for animals and um they also kind of buffer the coast from like storms. They create like a bit of a protection. And so we're seeing with climate change, like kelp forests are being lost and replaced by what we call turf. So these turf are like smaller algae that kind of more like just like a bushy cover instead of these large kelps. And so just from a structural point of view, like that is affecting, that's going to affect the ecology of the near shore coastal ecosystem in probably a negative way. How do invasive species uh, grow in these areas? There's a, quite a few species that are from like Asian origin that have been introduced to the Atlantic from oyster. I think it, a lot of it's from oyster farming or from oh. ballast water from ships, that kind of thing. And so um, we have one that's um, 
um, Dazzy Siphonia japonica, and that one was introduced. So you can kind of trace the pattern. It was introduced to Europe, and it kind of grew all along, and then it was introduced to North America. And that one, um, it just grows like crazy. So that's one that we would call invasive because it is not native, and it outcompetes native seaweed species. And it was so abundant in New England that they were using bulldozers to clean it off the beaches around Boston. Like Whoa. it was making these mounds of rotting seaweeds. That might have been a big like peak and it, it's not so bad, but it's still there and it's still causing a lot of problems. And this thing can reproduce. So like seaweeds have sexual reproduction like plants, which is super complicated and I won't get into it. But they also can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, that could be a whole other story. But this specific invasive species can reproduce by fragmentation, which means basically if a piece breaks off, that piece can grow into a new. So it's like, how do we even... How, do, like, how, how, how where do you even start with that yeah exactly so it's wow. just like that's these things and I don't know even um what the answer is to these kinds of things can you can you describe that feeling you know scientists who study ecosystems that are being affected by climate change it's really sad and you kind of you have this feeling of like okay we need to document this we need to tell people like you still kind of have this hope that like if we can tell people these changes are happening they'll take it seriously and I am an optimist, but part of me is like, oh man, there's just such a, there's just such resistance to taking this seriously. Or people say they take it seriously, but then aren't. It's just hard to watch. For example, I was scuba diving in, in Maine and I went to a site that I was diving at and I actually dove there 10 years ago on the same time of year. And it was seven degrees Celsius 10 years ago and it was 12 degrees. Oh, this whoa. year and so I'm like I know there's fluctuations I know but like it's just that's a big difference you know I love the ocean so much and I love I don't know if you know of Sylvia Earle she's like my hero she's this amazing 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 scientist scuba diver she's I think the woman who's been the, done the deepest dive of all time or she spent the most time underwater of all time like she's amazing and she has these areas that she calls like hope spots like areas where biodiversity is being preserved and like yeah I know right it's like hope spots and, yeah like you should look it up it's amazing and so I like the uh that positivity and that like hope for the future and that we can protect like a lot of studies show that if you protect certain biodiversity hotspots then those hotspots like bleed that biodiversity out into the rest of the ocean even if there's areas nearby that are more affected by fishing or whatever so mm. I think that and I see in Canada a lot of movement towards um, protecting marine, creating marine protected areas. And that uh, gives me a lot of hope too, because, and to have those areas co-managed like with indigenous people and have it be like part of the sort of coastal like economy, but yet also protecting biodiversity. I think there's like a ton of hope there. Yeah. So Sylvia yeah. Earle is, is someone that you really admire and someone that, that brings you hope. And optimism mm -hmm. and helps helps bring that along. Is there is there a piece of of advice that you were given that has been important to you and, and helpful to you? I've always been really enthusiastic, and people always tell me like keep your enthusiasm. You know, like scientists that are like it's it's such a passion project being a scientist, like working on something. So it's I I think sometimes I tell people and and I. I I'm trying to remember if anyone ever told me this. They probably did. <laughs> like, it's okay if you want to study something super, like, either eccentric or esoteric or something. Like, you know, I I took a seaweed class and I was like, wow, this is for me. So I just, I a just seaweed tell people, class. Yeah, that's like amazing. that's how I got into this was by. And now I'm teaching a class in two weeks on seaweed in Maine, and I'm like, wow, I feel like it's really come full circle. And I think. People sometimes think, oh, well, I can't study this super random thing I'm interested in. I'm never going to get a job. But like, and it is hard. Science jobs are hard. But like, I would still say, like, do it. Like, we need more people studying little things, studying things that not everyone else is studying. I, I, I have a question for you about the seaweed class. Like, what was it about that class that made you go like, yeah, this yeah. is it? So the class was taught by a professor who ended up becoming my PhD supervisor. Nice. And he's extremely enthusiastic about seaweed as well. And then I think for me, I had been kind of getting into botany. Like I was interested. I'd been taking a bunch of plant classes that I was an undergrad at the time um, in my undergraduate like biology degree. And I was kind of like, oh, plants are nice, but I really love the ocean. And then I took the seaweed class and I was like, wow, this is for me. Like it's, you know, 
just this is exactly what I'm so interested in. And then also I think knowing there's so much work to do for me felt like, oh, it's like tackling something that really needs like there's just such basic baseline biodiversity data like lacking that I thought like this is something that people really need to work on. And so I like the combination of I love pressing seaweeds and collecting them. And then I love the ocean. And then also knowing that it was a field that really needed it needed people, you know, so does it still need people? Yeah. And, and, and for sure, we're, there's so much cool research going on, but, but we need more people, I think, especially with, there's a lot of interest in seaweed aquaculture and seaweed harvesting. And then I think that that needs to be studied and managed, right. In a way that it doesn't harm the whole ecosystem. It's, it's very sustainable if done well. And so I just think we need more research. Yeah. And I still can't believe that I was lucky enough to get a job studying seaweed after doing a PhD on seaweed. I'm very happy about that. Mm-hmm. Is that not typical? Um, it's just hard. There's just It's just hard to find a job. It doesn't always line up that you study something and then at that time that job comes up that's really on that topic. So for me, the timing was just so perfect. Mm-hmm. I was really, mm-hmm. so really lucky. It sounds like you were meant for this role and it was meant for you. And it, it I feel sounds... that way sometimes. Like it's like pinch myself to thinking is this real? <laughs> totally. Oh. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I've learned so much and I, oh, wow. You are, you're a really great science communicator. It's, it's not easy to just know the thing that you are, you know, to know your profession and to be able to interact with the people who also understand that language, but to be able to communicate these complex things. And I'm not just talking about like the scientific names, but these ideas and, and the importance of them is, is difficult. And and I, I think that you do a really wonderful job of it. And I am so excited for your book. That's going to be yes. so cool. Seaweeds of Maine. Keep an eye out. Seaweeds it's of Maine. Be years, but we have probably hundreds of gigabytes of photos because we really wanted to be photo heavy. So let like people can pick it up, look at pictures. It's one thing that's missing from a lot of seaweed keys. It's like nice photos. Perfect. Oh, Amanda, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you for everything and for being a guest on In the Green Chair today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Until next time, this has been In the Green Chair. <laughs>